Well, today we're, we're actually looking at a very special passage today. We're looking at the birthday of the church, Acts chapter 2. And so I figured I'd share a little bit of trivia with you. Important birthdays that happen on this day, July 17th, throughout history. A um, guy by the name of Isaac Watts. Right. You know that name? Yeah. yeah. Credited with over 750 hymns that he wrote, including When I Survey the Wonders Cross and Joy to the World. Yeah. It's his birthday today. A guy by the name of Vince Garaldi. Is that how you say it? All right. Is that yeah. 50 hymns? No. Jazz pianist, uh, born in 1932, uh, best known for composing the music for the Charlie Brown TV specials. And um, for those contemporary music people among us, if you like country music, Luke Bryan's birthday is today. So, and if you don't know him, go look him up. He's good. Um, birthdays are a big deal. Um, they've always been a big deal in my house. You got to pick out what food you were going to eat. It's 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 a time to honor something. And um, today we're looking at probably the most famous birthday in all the world, and, and probably in my opinion the most important birthday in all the world, and that's that of the church. So um, let me read for us this passage. Uh, Acts chapter two one through thirteen. When the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and come, came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem and God-fearing Jews from every nation um, from under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard these heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? But some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Let's pray. God, um, thank you for breathing on the church. Thank you for this passage. I pray that you would speak to us about uh, where we're at in our lives, um, that you would remind us who we are in you and, and what you're calling us towards. Lord, we love you. Amen. So Pentecost, man, it's a big deal. It's it's 50 days after the uh, Passover um, Sabbath day. So this was a Sunday morning. People from all over have gathered at the Jewish temple, and, and it says they were there. This is the 12, the 11 remaining disciples, not Judas, but then we talked last week about how they threw dice to figure out Matthias wasn't to be the next one, but they sort of just included him. And uh, anyways, um, so they're gathered here, and, uh, and what happened is that what Jesus had talked about the gift of his spirit was given. Um, two weeks ago, we talked about the book of Acts, and we said, uh, Luke has a very interesting introduction to it. He says that this is his former book, the book of Luke, um, is when Jesus began to do and teach some things. And Acts is actually the continuation of it. It's when, it's when the disciples continued to do this stuff. Um, but Jesus warned them, both in the book of Luke as well as in Acts, don't go and just do the stuff. He didn't say, all right, go out and say all the stuff that I just said and do all the stuff that I just did. Wait, you have to stay here in Jerusalem and wait for something very special. I'm going to send my spirit. Um, John chapter 14 says, If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. That passage that we just read in Acts 2 is, is what happened when they waited. And um, I think it's key that we wait sometimes. The Spirit uh, of God is not 
we don't do this on our own. We aren't sent to go do this stuff uh, alone. Sometimes we have a tendency to go about life through our power and our strength in our method. And um, sometimes as Christians, I think sometimes we think of ourselves as messengers. We've been given this great message, and now we're supposed to go and deliver it. But we forget that um, the only way that it's delivered is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're actually representatives, and we can't represent God very well without God's help. As I look at um, Christian representations in the world that have not been uh, humbly prayed over and embodied with the spirit of who Jesus is, um, it gets sideways, it gets screwy, and the church doesn't look like the church anymore. Um, I think we get what it is to be a representative. I mean, we're in a political time, we're picking representatives, we know we have representatives from here that are supposed to go and speak for us. I think we get that. But another way of thinking of representatives is more like what they do with um, sponsorships. So Nike has LeBron James, you know, and uh, Alaska Airlines, we got Russell Wilson, our chief CFO, uh, chief football officer. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, this is actually a part of even my week and probably your week in some way. When I go and talk to another church about maybe sharing space after we're no longer in this building, they're introduced to me as Pastor Chris from Harvard Church, um, they're not really deeply concerned with who I am, but they're getting a feel of what Harvard Church is about through talking with me. I, I kind of represent Harvard Church, so I hope that's okay with y'all. Um, and hopefully I represent the value and the spirit and the character of our church as, as I do that. Um, but when folks don't represent uh who they're supposed to represent very well, um, Jared of Subway. <laughs> supposed to represent weight loss through eating lots of Subway sandwiches and came to represent uh, going to jail for uh, things that one should not do. Um, Tiger Woods, Nike dropped him like that. Everybody dropped him like that. After he poorly represented their values and spirit and attitude. And that, I think, is the most important part of, of how we're sent out. We're sent out to be Jesus' representatives to the world. Um, we're sent out uh, with this great message of God's love. But we don't just go to deliver a message. We go to deliver it with the spirit of Jesus in us. And when the spirit is along with us, we take on the attitudes and values and character of Jesus as we go. <clears throat> Now, there's um, some pluses and minuses to this. The plus is, um, you are never in it alone. When you wake up in the morning, as you know Christ, you do not enter your day alone. The Spirit has been given to you. I looked at um, initially becoming a Foursquare pastor, and one of the things that they were really concerned about was, when were you given the Holy Spirit? When did you receive the Holy Spirit? And... Um, they were looking for like two conversion stories. They wanted the one of when I met Jesus, and then they wanted another one of when like the Spirit just came upon me in a really powerful way. And my first essay was really good. It was long, and it was like, here's how I met Christ. Here's the whole story. I was going the opposite direction, and then some people invited me in. They represented Jesus really well to me, and I sort of started hanging out with them, and then eventually I read the book of John, and this came to be a reality for me, and that Jesus had died for me, and I accepted his grace, and my life totally changed, and here's where I'm at now. Um, and then my second essay was, um, in when did you meet the Holy Spirit? And I said, see above. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently that wasn't the answer they were looking for, and we decided to ways at that moment, but um, it's okay. Uh, I ended up in a good place, it seems. So, um, but the Holy Spirit is with us. In Christ. John was in a cave for the last few months writing a book, and I'm sure there were many days where he felt terribly alone as he poured over an empty white page trying to figure out what am I supposed to write now. But he wasn't alone. The Holy Spirit was with him. As you enter your week, as you encounter the people you encounter, as you walk through the stuff that you're walking through, you don't do it alone. Um, this week I've had multiple two hour long conversations with my 17-year-old niece about all sorts of things. 
And sometimes it's overwhelming. She has really big questions, and I don't know quite what to say, but I'm reminded I don't go into those conversations alone. The Holy Spirit is with me. Now, that's the plus side. We're not alone. The Holy Spirit is with us, and he guides us. The, the minus side is if, if we try to be really Jesus-y, if we try to represent Jesus without uh, the Holy Spirit, um, it's almost like the disciples running out before Pentecost happened and saying, I'm going to go do this. And I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but sometimes you're like, I've got a really good thing in front of me, and I think God wants me to do it, so I'm going to do it in my own power and strength. Um, this happens to me sometimes when I'm writing sermons, I start writing, and then I go, I don't know what to write. Ever feel like that, John? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, um, and then I, it's that moment that I go, oh yeah, I'm supposed to pray. <laughs> I'm supposed to wait for God to show up, and, uh, and I sometimes have to slow down and be reminded. I think sometimes as a Christian, it's really easy to go, oh yeah, I'm just rely on God. Um, but then there's events that come up in our life that, that uh, kind of make us step back and go, we actually have to rely on God. Um, I know at Mill Creek Community Church, um, there was a big event like that. Um, church was going along and we're all talking about uh, relying on God on a regular basis. And, and then um, a young man in our midst uh, had really bad leukemia. And um, suddenly there was this sermon that everyone kind of rallied around about relying on God. And, and there were these little bracelets in a Christian bookstore that said a frog on them. Sometimes they had a picture of a frog. And it stood for fully relying on God. And I would always look at that stuff and go, kind of cute, but kind of cheesy. <laughs> and walk on by. And in the context of this young man's life, relying on God as we prayed for him became a very powerful thing. Um, I don't know quite how to make that transition in our heads from just doing life on our own and sort of counting on Jesus to be there to actually going, I'm going to rely on God for this. But it's a powerful shift that happens. In John, you know, Jesus talks about uh, the vine and the branches. I think it's John 15, right after he talks about the giving of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, he obviously didn't mean that they could not get up and go through their day or not uh, go along with their life. They could keep fishing. They could do their thing. They could go through their days. But I think what he meant is, um, apart from me, you can do nothing in a God way. With God's wind in your sails. With God being the power and the strength and the encouragement and the patience that you need to do it. And he uses this image of a vine and the branches. Now, um, Vine and a branch, so there's there's the vine and there's the branches and they're bearing grapes and stuff. I don't think those branches are out there going, all right, I've got to power up my spirit, get all my strength together, and uh, I'm going to try my hardest today to pop out a grape. Go grape! It's not, that's that's not how we grow. That's not how things grow. Um, it's, it's not a, a will. And sometimes as Christians, I think we go, man, I just got to get more patient or more graceful or more kind. And I, I'm not representing Jesus very well. And so I got to try hard. And Jesus says, it's not, it's not that. You got to wait and, and let me infuse you with life-giving stuff. That's the image. If we want the most out of life, if we want the most out of this walk, if we want to be people who look like Jesus and who love like Jesus and talk like Jesus, care like Jesus, and bring truth to the world, it's going to happen because Jesus is in us doing it. Um, he's the wind in our sails. Um, speaking of wind, that's the first sign in our text of what God was doing. It says that they were all gathered together, they were sitting in a room, and then there was this powerful rush of wind. Now, that would be crazy if that happened right now. Your hair would get really messed up. Um, but I don't think that that was all that was going on. The wind has a representation throughout Scripture that they would have gotten as Jewish people. Um, word for wind, ruach, it means the breath, the spirit, the wind, it means all those things. And um, in Genesis 1, it's actually that word when it says, the spirit of God, the ruach, 
the wind of God was hovering over the deep and then uh, God began to speak and things came into being. God produces stuff in our life and there's uh, new life that emerges. There's God stuff that emerges in our life when God's wind blows. At my new house, uh, we're so blessed to be able to look out and see water. And usually, um, as I look out on my left side, there's sailboat classes in the morning. It's a particular time. It's like 8 o'clock in the morning. And there's all these little tiny sailboats. Um, and they're little guys, and they're, they're learning how to sail. Um, but on really, really still days, I look out. They're not there. They probably had class scheduled, and then it got canceled because there's just no wind. No. In our lives, if there is no Spirit of God at work, there's no spiritual movement in our life. No. Having wind in our sails is exactly what we need to be Christ to the world, to experience Christ. Um, second piece of that wind, uh, there was fire. And it said that there was there was a fire, and then it separated out, and there were tongues on each person's head, and um, it represented the Spirit of God coming and resting on them. And I was wondering, what, what would those tongues do, besides having fire on your head, which happened at my July 4th party, by the way, yeah. um, but I don't think it was like this. Uh, um, but a tongue of fire coming and resting, and, and and it, it represents the spirit. And sometimes I think we go, man, spiritual gifts, there's all these kinds of things. I wonder what that is. It feels so vague. Um, Galatians talks about the spirit in a very different way. The spirit of God, um, the fruit of the spirit in our lives is, is love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Um, those are incredibly practical things. You can have those things as you go through your day, no matter what you're doing. Whether you're a construction worker, whether you're sitting at a desk doing accounting, whether you're out on a golf course, patience is especially probably helpful then. Um, we could all use more of those things. And that's what the Spirit does when He infuses our life. And so I want to encourage us this week to just test it. Pray for God to show up in the midst of something in our week, something very practical. I think sometimes we pray um, and we lift up, I know I do it in church too, of things that are spiritual, like my niece coming to Christ. N nobody can make that happen except God, so I guess I'll pray for that. Um, and we pray for things that are out of control. Young man has leukemia. Uh, well, we can't fix that, so we'll, we'll pray for that. Um, so those are the two categories that we'd like to pray in, but we don't usually pray about all the other little things in the day. Um, and I had a, a, a boss who kind of gave me this encouragement. Um, he said, you know, what if every morning we got up, hop in the shower, bad image, wait, close the door. <laughs> okay. But um, during those times when we're getting ready, we um, pray through what's going to happen that day. Who are you going to meet? What are you going to do? What are you going to be working on? Just pray through that week or pray through that day and then see what God does. Um, now, some days I get up and I'm supposed to be somewhere, like men's morning Bible study. They can attest to the fact that even though I live 10 minutes away instead of a half hour away, I'm still late sometimes. Um, <laughs> on those mornings, I rush out and I go and I go and I go and I go. And then sometime along the way, I go, oh, shoot. I never slowed down. And I go through the motions, mostly. Um, slowing down, rushing less, um, allows the Spirit to infuse our lives. I want to touch um, briefly on this whole speaking in other tongues thing. It's a big part of this passage. It's been talked about a lot. John made me promise to not say to you all that. Uh, the only way you can be a good Christian is if you speak and talk. <laughs> and I was very glad to oblige to that. Um, this is pointed at as kind of the key moment when people began to speak in tongues. And um, it says they were speaking in another language. Some people thought they were drink, drunk. And um, I've been in contexts um, where there was speaking in tongues. And, and I have to admit that when I've prayed before, 
Um, there's there was times where I didn't have the words for it, and um, I was just praying to God in a language that I do not know, and hopefully He did. And um, it felt a little bit like um, when couples have nonverbal communication, they kind of look at each other and don't have the words for what to say, but the other one knows what's going on. Um, sometimes the Lord's Prayer is that for me. There's a lot going on, and I don't always pray, so I pray the Lord's Prayer. And I think God hears all the other stuff in the midst. Um, that is not what happened at this Pentecost. It was not a bunch of people spouting gibberish to look spiritual. Um, it says that they were empowered to communicate in languages that were not their own. Now, whether it was them speaking Persian or one of these other languages of the folks that were there, or whether it was in the ears, we don't know. But what we do know is that there were people from all over the world there seeing the 12 disciples filled with the Holy Spirit, and suddenly they're going, wait, they're from Galilee. How is it that they speak Italian? <laughs> it's not like my trip to Italy, I'll tell you that. We even used the books and tried to say the words. <laughs> and here they were proclaiming the glories of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the story of Jesus. And everybody's going, but they're from Galilee. They never went to school, and now they're speaking Italian. Um, in Genesis chapter 11, there's the story of Babel. And... Um, is after the flood, and God says, you know what, disperse over the earth. And they go, we don't need God's advice. We don't want to do what God tells us to do, so we're going to build instead a tower that will reach to the heavens and will be our own God. And they kept building, and eventually God comes down and says, you know what, this isn't what I said. So gracefully, what I'm going to do is redirect them into what I called them, and I'm going to do so by giving them different languages. And when people didn't understand each other, they dispersed. Um, this is the opposite of that story. Suddenly, people from all over the world are united in one thing because of the Spirit of God. Um, it's crazy when, as a Christian, you meet another Christian, and they can be not speaking the same language. They can be from a different place, a different family. I often greet you guys as brothers and sisters because I feel that way. Um, there is a unique unity that happens when people know the Lord together. And the point of this uh, speaking in other languages is the fact that we are empowered to communicate the love of God by the Holy Spirit to all sorts of cultures. Now we may not just have languages to overcome. I think especially in Seattle we have all sorts of other cultures. I know I recently have been um, dragged into more than my fair share of conversations with and about the LGBTQA community. Yes, I'm learning all of those, and I will someday sit down with you all and tell them. But um, in those moments, I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit can empower me to communicate the love of God to people. Um, you go to your work, and I don't know what you do for your work, or you go into your week. John communicates with people on the golf course sometimes, right? And, and God empowers you by the Holy Spirit to share the love of God with the person you're golfing with, or the person that you're uh, accounting with, or the person that you're programming with. Or I know this one guy, he's a um, really nice guy, but he's an accountant, and um, he really trusts that the Holy Spirit will empower him through the way that he has integrity in what he does, through the way that he treats people while he does it, um, that applies to all of us. And that's a spiritual gift. Um, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Um, and it's not just the people who don't know him. Um, Christians lose track of grace all the time. It's funny, when you run into something that you've blown or something that uh, you might have made a mistake in, or, um, how easy it is to feel, man, I'm a horrible Christian. And I know in those moments, other Christians have come around me and somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit have said, okay, Chris, God loves you. I had a guy walk up to me in a coffee shop. I was sitting there and I was doing over something. And he walked up to me and he said, I don't know why I'm supposed to tell you this, but he's a construction worker. He just came in to get his coffee and he goes, God's really proud of you. <laughs> like, 
All right. What do I do with that? <laughs> I guess God's real. That's what I did with it. It was the exact thing I needed to hear at the exact moment, and there's no other way except for the Holy Spirit that this happened. Um, we sometimes feel alone. In those moments, I believe that God powers people, and you guys, to speak the love of God to other people. Um, sometimes it's the people who don't believe, though, and, and, I, and I love how this passage ends. It says some of them go, what the heck just happened? Like I did at that coffee shop going, this is weird. <laughs> But it's curious and it's very cool. And um, there was a bunch of people who were amazed going, how, how could this happen? And they had to find out more. Um, and then there were some other people who go, well, I think they're just crazy. Maybe drunk. It is in the morning, so that's hard to do by then, but perhaps. Um, what if that was the response to people as we shared our faith? Some people go, man, this is crazy. You're saying God loves me. This is curious. I'm kind of attracted. It feels weird, but I'm going to go look at it. Um, that's what I kind of see is going on with my niece right now. But other people have said, that's just crazy, man. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Um, that's part of the story. I know that uh, I was once asked this question. If you were ever accused of being a Christian apart from Sunday morning, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I think it's a good question because really um, I don't think the primary place where the Holy Spirit needs to move is just on a Sunday morning God's got love to get out into the world that's the story of Acts is the spreading of the gospel through power and grace and through a community of people not unlike us And God can do it in all sorts of crazy ways. I was looking um, online at various churches to maybe share space with, and I found Skate Church, West Seattle. <laughs> you, know, you guys want me to go to West Seattle? The only problem is Skate Church doesn't actually have a building or a time that they meet. <laughs> I thought, this is quite curious. So I found out it's all by Twitter. You can follow them, and it will tell you the next skate spot to be at. And all these skaters get together and they skate for a while. And then they invite people to hang out with them while they talk about Jesus. That's skate church. How cool is that? That is cool. And then there's taxi church that I read about in New York. And their worship times are crazy times. Taxi drivers are on weird schedules. And I'm sure that as they're hanging out, they talk about their latest fares. And it's like 3 o'clock in the morning for some services. And but they're taxi drivers. And somehow the Spirit of God is at work in them. Uh, in reality, even though they're not formalized, I'm sure at Microsoft there's tons of programmers' churches. Maybe it's one guy who's a Christian who happens to be sitting in a bunch of cubicles with another bunch of people who may or may not be Christian, and the love of God is being shown there. We try and be a neighborhood church, something that impacts the community. Um, I don't think that just happens through programming happens through lives. Um, I've seen uh, many of you represent Jesus really beautifully in your neighborhood. That's a neighborhood church. Um, we've been given a circle of influence. Um, we've given people to encounter and we're invited to rely on the Holy Spirit and God can do it. Um, he does it through all sorts of different things and I believe that those flames separating represent each of our personalities being infused by God in a particular way. Some of you are so dang organized, I am not. Um, and you're so well organized, and God uses that. And some of you can play beautiful music, I cannot. But the Spirit of God used that to lift up my spirits this morning. So thank you. Um, the Spirit of God wants to grab a hold of our lives, and not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of everyone around us. Give us a walk that looks like Jesus so we can look like Jesus and be like Jesus and love like Jesus and experience abundant life like Jesus did. Um, so here's my challenge to you. Doesn't have to be in the shower, but pray through your week. Pick some things. What are you going to be doing? <clears throat> pray about them. Slow down enough. Ask the Holy Spirit to come. See what happens. Uh, Get some wind in your sails. Get blown about by the Lord. 
pick someone you're going to interact with and just pray for them that morning. And pray for our lives. Pray for ourselves that the Spirit would fill it. I, I, um, the girl who led me to Christ, I say led me to Christ, she actually led me to her church when I called and said, my life's going down the drain. I don't know what to do with it. And she said, well, you come to church. Um, and I said, all right, I'll try anything. Um, so I went to this church, and it wasn't through the sermons. Those were mostly over my head, and I go, I have no clue what he's talking about, but it's kind of interesting. Um, it wasn't through the singing, because I was definitely like lip syncing, because I didn't believe in singing out in public. It's, the only time I sang was in the shower, and I knew I didn't have a great voice. Um, it happened because there were all these people that kind of looked like Jesus and acted like Jesus and loved me like Jesus. Uh, that's uh, what started to lead me to Christ. And, and so uh, some offhanded conversation I had with this girl's mom, I, I said, you know what, you're a great mom. How did you get to be such a great mom? And she goes, well, I, I pray for my kids. And then she sort of stopped herself and she goes, more often than not, though, I pray for myself to be a good mom. I ask God to help me with that. Because I don't need God to just change my kids. I need to change too. And it was a really, really honest answer and it struck me. Because um, God's given us everything that we need. He's given us grace and forgiveness. He's made us who we are. He has us alive today for a purpose. And so we have this sail that's just waiting to get filled by God. And then the Spirit can blow. He can infuse our life in a very particular way for this particular day and for this particular week. So let's let God fill the sail. Let's rely on Him for the movement in our life, for the direction that will go this week. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. Lord, we trust you. Um, we trust you with everything. We trust you with our lives. We thank you uh, for giving us our lives and for putting us here. And Lord, you have stuff for us to do. You have kingdom work that you want to do, and you have people that you're going to bring across our paths and, and tasks that we're going to accomplish this week. And we could go do them alone. But it's so much more fun to do them with you. So, Lord, fill our sails. Guide us and direct us. Blow with your Holy Spirit and with your fire in our lives. We love you. Amen. Amen.